All right, yeah, thank you, Catherine, uh, for the introduction. Thanks to development for giving me the opportunity to talk about my postdoc work today. So I want to start out um, just with this general idea that most of our organs begin their journey into morphogenesis as an epithelial sheet overlying a mesenchymal stroma. A really critical step uh, to generate mature, functional, morphologically distinct organs is the emergence of folding or the generation of interfacial curvature at this epithelial mesenchymal interface. And this is often um, iterated across a field of cells to generate a pattern across the scale of the tissue. And a prime example of this folding, both positive and negative curvature, is the, the small intestine, which is the, the organ that I'm studying, where positive curvature generates these finger like protrusions called villi that dramatically increase the absorptive surface area of the small intestine required for nutrient absorption. And beyond just generating this uh, tissue architecture, um, the geometry of these folds can directly feed back and indirectly feed back as well to uh, specify cell identity and function such that you get these um, crypt domains where stem and progenitor cells ar arise um, and then differentiated cells um, line the, uh, the length of the villi. And so, the question I'm interested in is a very simple one, is how is this curvature initiated um, during embryogenesis, um, and specifically how this becomes patterned across the length of the intestine? And I've been studying this um, specifically in the mammalian system, so we use the mouse um, to look at this, and uh, a villus initiation in the mouse has been described, um, characterized to a good degree by Kate Walton and Deb Camuccio at University of Michigan, who showed that the first signs of villus formation um, occur coincident with the emergence of these green spots that line the length of, of the mouse gut. And if you zoom into a cross section of these spots, you, you can see that they're made up of mesenchymal aggregates of cells expressing high levels of PDGFRA. And these occur coincident with folding of the overlying epithelium. And the emergence of this curvature occurs over a very tight window of development, so really between E13 and E14.5 are the stages we're interested in. And again, the question that I'm interested in is how does this curvature really initiate? And the main hypothesis that I'll be showing today is that uh, I think it's that active mesenchyme, specifically these PDGFRA cells that are doing the work. So to get a clue at this, uh, we first just developed a, a system to do long-term time-lapse imaging of uh, tissue explants, so they developed ex vivo, much like they do uh, in vivo, so we can look at both the epithelium and the mesenchyme and see what's going on. What we note is that uh, really not much that you can tell differently from the, so the still images is that um, the mesenchyme is aggregating at the same time that the overlying epithelium is folding. So we're still left with the chicken and the egg type of problem, right? So in one model, you could imagine the epithelium is folding and that is directing the mesenchyme to aggregate. Or conversely, it could be that the mesenchyme is aggregating and that's driving the curvature in the overlying epithelium. And so to directly test this, uh, I did this series of tissue recombination experiments in which I uh, removed the native epithelium of the, of the gut tissue before aggregation had occurred and then replaced it uh, with epithelia of different sources. So the idea being if the, if the mesenchyme is really sufficient to drive this process, it should be able to fold uh, a variety of, of different interfaces. So we started with something similar, which is intestinal organoids. So these are epithelial tissues that have been grown for over a year in culture in the absence of mesenchyme. But if you recombine these with the embryonic mesenchyme, you still see uh, aggregation and the generation of curvature in these organoids. We then did the same thing with MDCK cells. This is the cell line that has nothing to do with villus formation, um, but the mesenchyme still aggregates, still generates curvature on the basal surface of, of the MDCK layer. So then we next asked, okay, well, do you need the epithelium there at all? So it turns out if you just call for the mesenchyme alone, uh, the tissue just kind of falls apart. So we reasoned there would be some signals emanating from the epithelium that would be required for the mesenchyme to stay alive. Um, but it turns out all you needed to do is uh, sprinkle in a little bit of hedgehog signaling because if you culture the tissue with smooth antagonists, the mesenchyme undergoes morphogenesis. Uh, you get aggregation and curvature generation, uh, but there are now no cells here. So the curvature is formed at the cell uh, media or cell liquid interface. So this shows really that the, the mesenchyme is sufficient to generate this curvature. And we next wanted to understand what is, what is the mechanism uh, through which this mesenchyme aggregates um, to generate the curvature. So we again turned back to live imaging um, and we imaged the whole field of these cells across a lot of different samples. 
Um, and what we can gather is that the process is highly dynamic, and I'm not going to go into all the quantification of details, but what we found are some key observations that the aggregate formation requires myosin uh, dependent cell motility. Um, there are two populations of cells here. There's a high aggregating cell and a low non-aggregating cell. And they move at different rates and have different properties. The motility is largely non-collective, so the cells are individually moving into the aggregates. And as the aggregates form, the cells continue to move within them. So diving deeper into the characterization of this process, uh, we took advantage of the fact that it's happening in a wave across the length of the tissue. So you can actually capture different snapshots of morphogenesis within the same uh, gut tissue. Um, so in the proximal region, the cells are just beginning to aggregate, uh, but in the distal region, the cells have uh, yet to aggregate. And what we saw was uh, really striking in that in the distal pre-aggregate regions, the cells, uh, as well as the extracellular matrix, were highly aligned along the long axis of the gut. Uh, but in the proximal region, uh, there was, there was uh, a loss of this or a decrease in this alignment. And this correlated with different modes of cell motility as well. So in the distal highly aligned regions of the gut, the cells weren't moving as fast. And when they did move, uh, their movement was largely confined uh, along this uh, scaffold of ECM, along this longitudinal axis. Whereas in the proximal part, as the cells were aggregating, the cells displayed much more diffusive cell motility. And so we hypothesized that perhaps there was uh, this switch in motility um, and aggregation of, of the mesenchyme that was enabled by matrix remodeling. And so we cultured explanted tissues in the presence of uh, MMP, matrix metalloproteinase inhibitor. And what we saw was that it completely shut down the process. So we still got PDGFRA high cells differentiating at the tissue interface, but they failed to aggregate and failed to uh, generate curvature. And so I, I didn't have time to get into a lot of the, the sequencing uh, data that we've done as well, but we can start putting this together into a model where we have morphogenesis happening really at, at two scales here. Um, at the tissue scale, we have a sheet of cells that's breaking up into a series of aggregates. And then at the cell scale, um, what's going on is early on, there's a highly aligned cell and ECM composite and then there's a wave of MMP activity in the tissue that we think is acting to, to essentially fluidize it and allow the mesenchyme or allow the, uh, yeah, the PDGFRA high mesenchyme to begin moving around. Um, they then come into contact with each other and through uh, differential uh, cohesive uh, properties, they begin to aggregate. We think this is further facilitated by a, a, a expression switch from fibrillar to non-fibrillar ECM. And so uh, we began drawing analogies at the tissue scale of this process um, to the de-wetting of a thin liquid film, um, which rounds up to form droplets uh, from its substrate. So this is similar to water uh, eating up on a windshield or on a leaf um, uh, through the process of, of energy minimization. And so in doing so, this droplet as it forms generates characteristic contact angles and curvature at, at the interface. So this looked qualitatively similar to what we were seeing with a sheet of PDGFRA high mesenchyme breaking up into a series of droplet-like aggregates. And so uh, we wanted to look, uh, a precondition for this obviously would be that the tissue would have to be behaving in a fluid-like manner. Um, and I don't have time to go into to all the different characterizations we've done today, but I just want to highlight we've done a, a suite of different uh, um, tissue uh, level characterizations um, to to get a sense that, this, that the mesenchyme is really acting like a, like a fluid. Um, so for example, the, the PDGFRA high mesenchyme has uh, lower elasticity, so it's less solid like. Um, it's, it has a higher surface tension as we've tested by uh, uh, micropipette aspiration, as well as the, the coalescence of, uh, of uh, isolated aggregates in vitro. And then finally, from our live imaging, um, we see that there's a high amount of neighbor exchange uh, between, uh, between the cells as they are aggregating and after they've aggregated. And so uh, building from this, this idea that the tissue is behaving like fluid, um, it, it has uh, these motile and adhesive properties. Uh, we wanted to build a, a computational model to make some predictions about the system, further understand it. And so this was work largely done by Temu and other postdoc in the lab. Uh, with help from Jake. We generated several classes of models. And I'm just going to show one here today, which is a cell-based uh, SPV model. So where we parameterized differential motility um, as well as differential adhesion of these different cell populations. 
uh, based on uh, some of our experiments. And then when we run the simulation, we can see just like in the tissue, um, this green PDGF ray high layer breaks up into a series of droplets that are then stable. So then we use this to make some predictions about the system. Uh, first, we changed the amount of cells that were there to begin with and found that simply by changing the number of PDGF ray high cells, we were able to change the, the size and the spacing of the aggregates. And we could test this in vivo by using uh, molecules uh, that we found to either increase or decrease uh, the amount of starting material and see that the same scaling uh, laws hold true. We then changed uh, where these cells are patterned. So we put the PD Jeffrey high cells deeper within the tissue and saw that now beyond just forming the interface, we get these deeper ectopic aggregates. And we find that uh, just by incubating the tissue with longer uh, durations of sonic hedgehog exposure, um, we're able to induce ectopic aggregates deeper in the tissue um, that really form these like spherical droplets, highly consistent with uh, a fluid-like uh, dewetting mechanism. We can then change the cohesion and find that uh, by altering the, uh, the way that these cells interact with each other, by lowering the cohesion, the clusters are less stable. And we see the same thing when we when we lower the cohesion of, the, of these aggregates by uh, modulating integrant activity. So now cells, instead of staying in one place, move between um, the different clusters, destabilizing uh, the whole process. And then finally, um, we look to see what would happen if we change the activity. So I didn't say this, but but normally the, the, the epithelial layer is highly static. And so we think that epithelium is more restrictive and solid-like. But if we computationally in a simulation fluidize the epithelium, so allow it to undergo neighbor exchange, uh, we see it coalesces over short time scales. And we can see the same thing in vivo if we just simply remove the epithelium. So now the cells are exposed to a fluid interface uh, directly. And uh, what we see is that while the aggregates form, they eventually coalesce, uh, further re um, uh, reducing their overall, uh, overall surface energy, again, consistent with this uh, uh, dewetting mechanism. Um, so yeah, to bring it all together, um, we think that, uh, that the initiation of villi is uh, a result of what we're calling active mesenchymal dewetting, where a sheet of PGF ray high cells breaks up into a series of droplet-like aggregates to try to minimize their surface to volume ratio, and in doing so generates curvature at the interface uh, through high surface tension, which itself is a product of the high cohesion of the aggregates. And so we think this, among you know, these other motifs of ways to pull the tissues, is a new way to pull the tissue that invokes the, invokes the active properties of a subepithelial population of cells. Um, and so we're, we're looking at other systems right now to see if this is a, a common feature that's, that's more widespread um, throughout development. Um, and with that, I want to uh, thank uh, the, the team. Um, it's been a long project in, in the making. And uh, we will we'll, uh, stop there and be happy to take any questions. Great, thanks so much, Tyler. That's really fascinating. Uh, if anyone has any questions, if you could type them into the to the Q and A box. Um, I was wondering whether you've looked at what's actually happening in the overlying epithelium when that aggregate starts to form. Have you got either signaling or mechanical sort of translation into the epithelium that's then inducing further? Uh, deformation of the overlying epithelium? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, we've looked at that a little bit. And so we think the epithelium really is playing a restrictive role. So the epithelium does change shape. The cells themselves change shape. Um, and, and, and those shape changes seem to be um, pretty long lasting. So the epithelium, in fact, seems to uh, then trap the aggregates in place, um, kind of maintaining the overall form of the tissue. Um, but we don't know if that's just a direct effect of this kind of mechanically induced changes or if there's signaling as well. Certainly, there, we know there's signaling from these aggregates to the epithelium. And then the, the subsequent sort of growth outwards of the, I don't know if you've looked sort of longer term of that villus, is that due to sort of further migration within of the underlying mesenchyme? Or was that then sort of taken over by the epithelium? Yeah, also a great question. We haven't really looked beyond these first initiating steps. We think <laughs> that there are secondary active mechanisms that are likely at play. Um, these aggregates kind of stay attached to the uh, villi as they elongate. Um, but we think there are also things happening kind of in the space in between the villi with the epithelium, which is rapidly growing there, kind of pushing down in, into the tissues. So it's, um, it's definitely more, it's a coordinated thing. The mesenchyme 
initiates the process, but then you you need the uh, yeah, coordination across both tissue layers likely. Ah, great. And then we have a, a question from uh, James Glover who says, great talk. What's the level of wind signaling in the PDGFR high cell closest to the epithelium? Yeah, so, so those cells actually uh, secrete a lot of wind, um, and which signals to the epithelium. There's not really wind signaling within the aggregates themselves, at least canonical wind signaling. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that non-canonical wind signaling is playing, is playing a role in, in the aggregation. But uh, you actually need went very early on to turn on sonic hedgehog in the epithelium. So there's this whole signaling relay that's been played out very from much earlier stages in development. Great, thank you very much, Tyler. So uh, we've uh, reached exactly uh, the hour. So I'd just like to uh, close by thanking again, uh, Anshal, Tyler, and um, and Eleanor for for really great talks. I've really enjoyed. Uh, the session and to remind you again that the next uh, edition will be on uh, June the 21st. Um, the details of that are in the chat and also you can find that out on the node. Um, so please do register for that if you're interested and thank you very much all of you for, for joining us. Thank you.